You are listening to Creating Active Lives with me, Sarah Blytho, and my regular weekly guests. And we are all here to share the research, the science, and the strategies, as well as some of the fun, to help you to create a more active life. Hello and welcome to Creating Active Lives. And my guest this week is Kevin Kibble, who is going to talk to us about his um, experience, I suppose is a good word, but with prostate cancer and how important activity has been in that. Kevin is a former chief executive at Nurture UK, which promotes nurture practice and education, especially for children and young people with social, emotional or mental health issues, uh, which sounds like a really, really important charity. And maybe that maybe that's another another podcast with that one. But what we're really here to talk about, and I will get you to introduce yourself in a moment, is kind of your experience with prostate cancer and particularly the sort of physical activity side of it. So, Kevin, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, well, I, uh, I am now finally retired after a portfolio career, um, going from engineering through um, publishing into um, the voluntary sector, where I was chief executive of a few charities, ending up doing eight years at Nurture UK, which was a fabulous job. Um, and um, yeah, I, and oh, during that time, I've seen so many different aspects of life that um, I've really enjoyed working with. But one of the things that I think um, has been helpful on my journey uh, with, with cancer is that I got involved for quite some time with um, the whole aspect of around um, what were cancer outcomes like. So um, uh, a lot of people in the voluntary sector know me because of my work with In Memoriam, for example, and, uh, and, and the like. So, um, yeah, I've, I've had a quite, quite a wide experience and I'm now in my 70th year um, and still, still pretty active. So um, I think that's probably me. Yeah, I just wanted to add, actually, that um, you were chief executive at Transplant Sport UK, which um, a lot of people may not be aware, but there is a dedicated kind of, if you like, Olympics type thing called the Transplant Games, which is for anybody who's gone through any kind of transplant. So activity has obviously been a big part of your career as well as your personal life as well, um, hasn't it? Yeah, I, I mean, that, and that was inspirational uh, to see the benefits um, of um, post-transplant patients and how um, they were able to return to full competitive sports in a lot of cases and had damn good at it too. Um, that that was inspirational to me. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I, and you look at how people overcome quite adverse conditions to become pretty fit. Uh, I think I think it's wonderful to see, just absolutely wonderful. And I, and I loved that job. I was only there for uh, sort of nine months, maternity cover type thing. But, um, yeah, very, very inspirational. So prostate cancer, mm. um, when were you diagnosed and how, how did the diagnosis come about? So kind of two questions there. Right. I was actually given my final diagnosis in January 2023. Um, right. I had had no symptoms of prostate problems um, that, I, that I was aware of or that I should have been looking out for. Um, I knew about the classic ones, which was, you know, um, uh, when you're, when you're having a pee, can you maintain the flow and all those kind of things that chaps should know about? And, and I was aware of that, and I had none of those. It all uh, came about that um, I had a chest infection back in uh, November 2022, and um, it was a real nasty one. I had massively high temperatures and was drinking mass a, a huge amount. And, of course, you can never get to see the doctor, so most of this thing was done, most of the uh, initial consultations were done by the phone. And a and GP, she was lovely. And I, and I said, look, um, you know, I, I can't get over this chest infection. Well, we're going to give you antibiotics. Um, but well, can you get into the surgery for a blood test? And I said, yeah, I'll, yeah, I can manage that. I said, but, um, uh, you know, other things I like. I'm drinking so much. I'm, <laughs> I'm not getting any sleep because I'm getting up to the loo sort of three or four times a night. And it was at that point she said, oh, I think we'll add a PSA test as well because you haven't had one for a while. And I didn't really think any more of it. Um, went to get my um, antibiotics and uh, I got a, a text from the GP surgery saying, 
about three or four days later saying your PSA is a little bit raised. We're not over concerned about it, but um, uh, we'd like you to come back and do another follow up blood test 10 days after you finish taking the antibiotics so we can see it's not that in your system. So we went through that and then I had another text um, from the GP saying you know, your PSA hasn't gone down. It's gone up a little bit more. And it's still only at this stage. It was registered at 6.8, which um, for a man of my age, yeah, it's a little bit high, but not not alarmingly so. And uh, the GP said, you know, we can you know, perhaps have a telephone call about this. So we talked it through and I had three options. Um, it could be uh, gone to what they call active surveillance. So I'd go in every three months to have it checked. Um, I could uh, um, go into the surgery to have uh, a, a physical examination and or I could be referred to the urology department at um, the local hospital, which is, uh, in my case, the Homerton in Hackney. And um, because uh, my wife and I were planning on moving to Cornwall, um, we were about two weeks away from exchanging contracts. Um, so I said, look, can, can I just have referral to urology? I'd rather know there's nothing sinister going on. Um, is that OK? And he said, yeah, fine, I'll refer you. You should hear within the two week period of, of cancer specification. So that was fine. I got a call from the urologist maybe a week later. And uh, we had a long conversation about what was happening to me and the PSA levels and everything. And he said, yeah, perhaps we'll get you in for an MRI scan sometime in the new year. I'm not over concerned with those levels. They're not particularly high. Um, anything you know, else we should know about you? Is there any cancer in your family? And I said, yes, both my, my mother and my sister both died from breast cancer. And then, the, and then the, the conversation changed in a second. And he said, right. And, and this was a week before Christmas. Um, he said, right, we'll get you in uh, day after Boxing Day. It's the first day we're back um, for your MRI scan. And that was, you know, alarm bells started ringing at that stage. So we put on hold the sale of the house and everything. And um, I went in and had my MRI scan. Um, we're going to a hospital the day after box day is empty <laughs> just wander in and uh, you know and yeah in and out of the scanner and, and I'm not very good on scanners so I'd taken a couple of diazepam um, so I actually fell asleep in the scanner and um, uh, but he called me the next the urologist called me the next day and said not quite sure what we can see going on there he said um we'll book you in for some biopsies and if we don't need if I get clearer pictures and we don't need them I'll cancel it I said, okay, fine. So we booked it for the uh, uh, 12th of January. The hospital called me a couple of days later and said, look, we've had a cancellation. Can you come in on the 5th of January for your biopsies? And I thought, mm, this is not right. You know, they, they, people don't cancel these kind of things. This, this, isn't, this isn't right. And I went in on the, on the 5th to have my biopsies done, sat with the guy who was going to do it, and he started talking through what the process was going to be. And uh, which all sounded pretty unpleasant, and it is. Um, and he said, um, and I can see where the cancer is. And that's how I was told uh, that I had it. Oh, my goodness. Um, so um, that, was a, that was a hell of a shock. Um, came out there to the waiting room, waiting to go down to the um, mini theatre to have these biopsies done. And I couldn't get a signal for, for my wife to tell her, you know, this is what it is. So I, I set up a text. I thought, it will go, you know, when I get a bit of signal. Yeah. Um, anyway, we were walking. I had to walk from one side of the hospital to the other. Not very nice when you're in one of those gowns and <laughs> slips. No. But um, you know, uh, we did get some signal. I said, "Yeah, this, this I've definitely got cancer, but I don't know what what, a, what level or anything it is yet." I had I had the uh, biopsies done, and just as they were finishing, um, they said, "Right, uh, we're going to send you for a bone scan because you know." Just to check, it's just, it happens all the time, you know, with this kind of uh, thing. Thought, oh God, right? This, is, this doesn't sound good at all. And um, I think it was a week later. I was in uh, Whittington having a bone scan. Um, right. Late afternoon, I was the last one to go through. And as I came out of the, the scanner and I'm walking back to the waiting room, my wife was waiting. I looked through to where the the lady was operating machinery and I said, Oh, is that me up on that screen? The little uh, uh, bone uh, skeleton out spine on this. Yeah. And I need you to go back into the scanner because there's a couple of areas I want to look at in a bit more detail. And I thought, mm, This isn't very good either. Um, and uh, so we did that. 
And then I got a call from the neurologist saying, right, we're taking your all the we'll bring all the findings together. But we'll have a meeting with the multidisciplinary team and I'll call you on the 31st of January and we'll have a, 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 a final diagnosis of what we're, and what we're going to do about it. He said, you've always been told there is cancer there. And um, so, yeah, on the 31st of January, um, they called me. All this was done over the phone. I'd not met the urology team or anything at this stage. Right, really? Um, he called me and said, right, you've got advanced prostate cancer. Um, it's spread outside your prostate. Um, you've got it has metastasized into um, your pelvis, lower spine and rib cage. Um, and there's nothing we can do. Um, you know, it's inoperable. So um, we're going to start you on hormone treatment. That, that's what we're, the best thing is. And then once we've started that, we're going to hand you over to uh, oncology. Uh, and that was devastating. That was really, really devastating. Um, absolutely no up. symptoms whatsoever. Yeah, uh, a- absolutely devastating. Um, so that afternoon, I was down at the Homerton collecting my first set of drugs. Um, a week later, I was in the hospital getting my first prostate injection. Um, which is uh, a solution that's mixed up in the hypodermic and then injected into you, into your arm. And it's quite a long way. It's called a depot injection, so it acts over a 12-week yeah. period. Um, and the uh, urologist actually took some time off to come in and talk to me at that stage, first time I'd met him. And um, he said, oh, we're really sorry, um, nothing more that we can do, et cetera. Um, so... In the meantime, Penny and I have been reading up everything we could find on it. Um, what does this mean? What does advanced prostate cancer mean? Um, uh, and what's the outcome? Because no one's, at this stage, no one's talking to you about what outcomes and, and things are. And, um, you know, you're, we were looking at everything that we could find. And one of the things that was in the um, Prostate Cancer UK information, which is really good, by the way, loads of pamphlets on there and it's a brilliant system if you're ever worried about prostate cancer that's the place to go first of all there's a there's a risk assessment on there it takes you 30 seconds to do it all those kind of things there is some brilliant stuff out there um, but one of the things on there was you know this is not the end of the world you know don't just sit back and take it get out there and get fit and um that was the least that i could do because i was fit before the diagnosis and before I got the, the original chest infection, I was working out two or three times a week. I had a personal trainer. Um, I, I had, uh, my body measurements were really good. B, um, my BMI was in you know, pretty good shape, down to 80, 81 kilos. That you know, I was really as, as probably as fit as I could be. Um, and so I thought, well, at least I can I can do something like that. I started going back to the gym again, um, but. The effect of the hormone drugs that they, they put me on have some really weird side effects. And um, the injection is, um, for a couple of weeks after that, I'm probably at my lowest. I have um, mood swings, tiredness, um, all, those, all those kind of things. And it's very low motivation. Yeah, I mean, the thing I think a lot of people who, who might be listening – when we talk about hormone treatments, um, they basically remove the hormones that the cancer feeds on. So in your case, it would be androgen deprivation therapy. So your testosterone levels would really, really drop. Um, and they can have devastating side effects for people, particularly as I think some of them are very emotional, very cognitive, which you don't expect. Yeah. I mean, it comes out of left field a lot of the time. Um you do have to prepare yourself for a complete change of life. I mean, it is it is life changing, and um, if yeah, it's difficult for a guy um, to imagine having no testosterone in his system. You know, it's it because we've lived with it all our lives, and all of a sudden it's just not there. And all your expectations about your life have, have, have completely changed. And um, but uh, what I would say is, it's, it, it is something you can come to terms with it's not the end of the world because when i had my first meeting with my oncologist having you know we we've gone through meetings after meeting on the phone and goodness knows what else and the news seemed to have got worse and worse and worse and it was a case of better get my affairs in order you know and all that kind of thing um 
to the first meeting with the oncologist and they said, right, this is what we're going to do. You're on the Prostap injections. Now we're going to put you on uh, daily doses of venzalutamide. And I said, okay, I've read about that. Um, it's another hormone treatment. She said, yes, they work in tandem. They don't do exactly the same thing. They work in tandem. Um, but you will be catapulted into the menopause almost overnight, basically. And um, I said, okay, uh, right. And okay, my wife turned to me and said, now you'll know what it was like for me. Um, and, uh, uh, but they said, you know, um, you know, this will keep, uh, we think will suppress the, the cancer and stop it feeding on anything else. So hopefully we can, you've got quite low burden of cancer. The, um, they're more like lesions and tumours at the moment. So, uh, and we want to keep it that way. So um, we'll give you these drugs and we'll monitor you every eight weeks. And uh, you'll come back and you have a full set of blood tests and then we'll, we'll see you every eight weeks and see how that goes. Um, but there are side effects. And um, one, of the, one of the big side effects of enzalutamide is uh, bone density. You lose bone density, weakening of the bones. So um, I said, so being fit, I said that, I've read that that's a, a, a big helpful thing for that. I said, absolutely. All the muscles that support your bones the more strength you can put into your muscles, the better it is for you. The longer you'll be able to stay fit and healthy, in, in healthy in inverted commas, but, you know, it's, um, the longer you'll be able to, uh, to, to stay leading a, a pretty much a normal life. And these drugs, when they stop working, we've got others that we can give you. So the, the, the whole conversation turned into a much more positive outlook. Uh, and that was kind of a kick up the backside to say, right, you know, things aren't quite as bad perhaps as we thought they were going to be we um it's not ideal but there, there are options it's nice to know that there are options yeah. and and that the yeah. oncologists are more positive than the urologists so and i'll be honest as well you know, I, most people know this is a field i i teach in um treatments are new treatments new clinical trials all sorts of things are coming through all the time so it's it's not like it was say 40 50 years ago now there is there are so many more treatment options that you know if one isn't right for you or, or stops working as you say there's something else that they can put in place but you know for me I, and a lot of the people listening will know that activity is one of these things being active beforehand is obviously great yeah um but even if you're not activity starts to become really really important doesn't it? it as both both as a, a sort of um a management of side effects but also in maintaining quality of life yeah absolutely and i think if i hadn't been as fit as i was before i started i might have struggled a little bit more um but uh you know it the, the proposal was that the homerton was that they had this prehab program and that's for a program for people before their treatment um particularly for before surgery for cancer i can't have the surgery but that doesn't mean to say that i'm still not having treatment so i qualify for this um and it basically it's um three one-hour sessions a week at um uh, a mini gym in uh, hackney um and it's free paid for by the nhs um, and it's part of a program that they're rolling out to try and get more cancer patients to get fitter before they get their treatment. So um, it's a small gym with um, basic uh, exercise equipment in it, which was actually, you know, I, no disrespect to that. I'm used to doing a lot more, but all of a sudden I found perhaps I couldn't do quite as much as I expected because of the side effects of the drugs. Um, but I'm now... Um, the, you know, almost. I think I started that program around April May time. So here I am, sort of six or seven months in, and we're now talking about me moving out of that program and taking uh, uh, a specialist trainer into the gym with me to produce uh, um, a program that fits my particular cancer diagnosis. Um, so one of the, this prehab program in the gym with you, there are, there's a, a prehab technician, there's a specialist trainer who has training in working with cancer patients. There's a dietitian, um, physio, all those are there to support uh, people going through this 
journey. Utterly brilliant. Yeah. Do you know what? I may well have trained the um, fitness specialist because <laughs> I've trained so many of them over the last 10 years that um, you never know, you never there know, may be one of mine. Maybe that's, the, be quite fun. Maybe that's the case, but, but it is utterly brilliant because there's, there's people going into that gym. Um, uh, at first, when I first went there, there was hardly any females, almost all male going in. And slowly but surely, uh, and I think a lot of this is the work that Macmillan doing, encouraging people to come to it. Uh, we've had more, particularly uh, women who are a bit older, you know, who've never dreamt of coming into a gym, w- would not have in a million years have dreamt of coming in. It's such a supportive environment because we're all in the same boat one way or another um, and are now working out in the gym, going through their exercise program, building up their um, strength and resilience um, and feeling better when they come out. Whew. That was okay, you know that 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 was good, um, and, and it's it's such a positive thing that um, you see the I've seen the change in these people over six months. Remarkable. The gym's now full. Those sessions are now full, um, and they're trying to get funding to extend it. You know, I've, I've said I'll help out with anything I can on the uh, on the fundraising side of that, but. Yeah, it's uh, but also my wife could go with me as well. So, you know, in the early days, that was very helpful. That kind of support. Now she doesn't need to come with me. I go on my own and um, uh, I now have to go and get bigger weights out of the main gym because the little weights in the little gym aren't, aren't enough anymore. Um, and whereas I could mid row 22 kilos when I was at my fittest, I'm now back up to 16 kilos. Really, that's really way and above what's in that gym, which is no, normally up to four. So, my fitness is coming back in terms of my strength. Uh, I can't run um, anymore. I can walk, um, and I've set myself a challenge to walk a thousand miles this year. Um, and so, uh, having a dog, of course, helps because it needs walking every day. But um, the strength side of my fitness is really beginning to come back. Um, I've got a lot of issues around um, being careful with bones and stuff. So, how I, particularly, I've had a lot of injuries during my lifetime of you know, sport. People tell you to play sport all the, all the time when you're young because it's good for you. It yeah, damn well isn't later in life. <laughs> so, yeah, all my, <laughs> right, it comes home to roost, doesn't knees, it? Knees shot, <laughs> shoulders shot, yeah. elbows shot, um, yeah. you know, operations on all of them. And um, But, you know, it's. Staying active um, is absolutely key to it. And there are times in the morning when I don't really want to get out of bed, but the dog's got to be walked and it's cold and it's wet. And all that. By the time I'm out and really the dog's running off doing her own thing and I've got my, I'm alone with my mind and I'm walking along the riverside at uh, Walthamstow Marshes or um, Leighton Marshes and all of a sudden I'm back into the zone. You know, um, I'm back being me again and i'm thinking ahead i'm not thinking backwards i'm thinking ahead really really important what am i going to be doing next week well you know what what the you know what kind of kind of things that you lose if you just sit thinking oh god why is this happening to me i do yeah i i know was so marshes in fact my son walks his dog there most mornings so you've probably passed cross paths at some point and and actually it is quite a it's a beautiful environment to be able to access for walking. And I think that does help, doesn't it? When you, when you're not in the mood, when you're just feeling, you think, no, cause I can go out there and I can, I can just be by the canal or I can be by the, the reservoirs and just be out in nature. Even though I'm in the middle of London, I'm in, I'm in nature and I can just enjoy the moment. And I think that's, that's a real benefit, isn't it? It's being able to, to just walk oh, somewhere like that. Uh, absolutely. And the thing with a dog is people will talk to you. Um, and if you don't want to talk to them, you just say, you just say, sorry, I've got to keep an eye on the dog sort of thing. Um, but otherwise p- people, other people with dogs will sit and chat to you for, for ages while the, you know, especially if the dogs are playing together, that's, and, and so you're meeting different people and it's, um, it, it really is a, a very, very positive thing. And that's all, and it's all linked together with not sitting on your ass and worrying about it because so what it, what will be, will be. Hard to get your head around that, and I, I understand that. And I've had some really great um, psychological support from the Homerton Hospital as well, 
that's that's all you know, included in the cancer support that I've had there, which has been brilliant, I have to say. Um, thank God for our NHS. And um, the, uh, yeah, kind of lo- I, I lose my track sometimes with, with these hormone drugs, but staying in the zone when you're out, you're, you, it allows you to breathe just differently. You know, you're, uh, I, I, I like to walk at a fair pace. If I'm walking with my wife, we tend to dawdle around and look at things and, and stuff. Uh, and she's a bit shorter than me, so her little legs don't walk quite as quickly as mine do. Um, and so, you know, I, I tend to I tend to walk that pace. And the dog does. The dog loves it. The dog. The faster I walk, the more the dog likes it. So um, that's the way I get get most of my exercise now through walking. I've got sets of weights here at home. Um, set up a bench in the in the spare bedroom upstairs, so I can do a little bit more. I, I don't always have the motivation to do it, um, and, and nor do I want to turn into someone who's so fixated about my fitness that I forget everything else that's enjoyable in life. Um, it's finding the balance, isn't it? So you were obviously—I mean, you've obviously been given so much support and advice and opportunity around exercise and activity, and I know. That's not always the case in a lot of places. People aren't always advised about it. I mean, it is something I know that Millen are working on um, very, very proactively is getting advice around being more active as early as possible, as close to diagnosis as possible, and hopefully starting to provide opportunities for activity within the hospital setting, the clinical settings, because it just makes it so much easier. But you're... um, you're actually actively promoting this now, aren't you? You've taken a much more proactive role, not just exercising yourself, but helping other people. Yeah, uh, absolutely. We what we've done is uh, when I when I was diagnosed, there wasn't a drop in centre for um, men with cancer in in our area. So, with the help of the men and link person, we got that organised, and it's taking its time, slowly stepping up. But actually, we've we've invited women in as well. Um, and it's a new drop-in group. And this is good because we talk amongst ourselves. And uh, we have different people coming to talk to us. The, guy, the chief executive of the Orchid Cancer Charity came in and talked to just a group of guys on Tuesday. And that's really interesting because we're talking about stuff guys would never talk about. You would never discuss this in the pub with your mates. And um, looking back, you think, oh, God, I wish I had done you know, and, and I wish I had had a chance to do that. So now, every time I meet someone, you know, when was your last PSA test? You know, it's not the be all and end all, but for God's sake, it's an eight quid test. If your GP really won't give it to you, buy it. You know, it once a year, eight quid, you can't afford that. Come on, your life is worth more than that. But the, the GP has a um, an obligation to provide you with a PSA test once a year if you request it. You know, they are obliged to do that. So don't let them fob you off. It's absolutely important to do that. That's a one, one part of prostate health. Staying fit is a real, real bonus. But it's being fit in the right way. Um, pounding the roads running is not necessarily the best way of staying fit. Muscle strength. Building those muscles. You don't have to be Charles Atlas. Most people won't remember Charles Atlas, but um, you don't have to. You know, you don't have to be built like some kind of man machine to to um, you know, Schwarzenegger's like to, to 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 be that. You just have to have a much more um, support of your joints and, and and bones in your muscles. So legs, arms, shoulders. That's where it's that's where it's really important to build those muscles. Never mind about your six packs and all the rest of it. Because if you go on hormone yeah, it's, treatment, it's, that's gone. You know, I, I've, I've put on four, It's quality of life, four. isn't it? It's functional ability yeah. as well, being able to carry on doing things. And in actual fact, the NICE guidelines, National Institute for Health and Care Excellence, um, the government body that, that puts out guidelines, the NICE guidelines for prostate cancer do include recommendations for muscular strength yeah. and endurance activity. Um, really important. But as I say, I think the important thing is that you know, there is support out there. Macmillan usually are in most hospitals with their advice and even if you know they've got leaflets they might not have a a specialist there but certainly there are specialists out there um i know there are a lot of cancer rehabilitation trainers out there um trying to get more and more into hospitals but what would your be what would your advice be to somebody who um is newly diagnosed 
um, and and isn't being given advice around activity. Ask, make make a nuisance of yourself. Make a nuisance, of, you know, uh, because they often often to be fair to clinicians, they're really under pressure and they don't have massive amounts of time. Um, but you know, that doesn't matter. Grab you know, grab hold of them and just say, right, what happens next? What am I entitled to? Um, I haven't taken up my GP surgery of free gym membership yet because I've been using the, the prehab session at the hospital. But I know my GP surgery through that, through the Better Health program, I'm entitled to free six months gym, gym membership. I will take that up as and when that comes, uh, uh, when, you know, when I'm moved off the prehab sessions um, and, and you know, ask for what you want. You know, can I get Macmillan's are great because they will tell you what you can, what you're entitled to. They are they are really really well briefed these people, and they do. I mean, the Macmillan Move More Pack, which they will send you free of charge, um, has a DVD of just simple exercises that you could do at home as well. Yeah. Just you know, chair based or standing. And I think yeah, you know, at the end of the day, clinicians their role is very very defined they're not there to be physical activity advisors but um ideally they'll be able to signpost you to somebody who is yeah. and can give you that specific advice and support and it is out there it's it's spreading more and more and more and Macmillan is a really good place to start because they do they do have these move more programs in a lot of places and um you know they do have access to information about qualified trainers and I think one you know you were saying you that they had a, a specialist in in the gym with you it is important to work with somebody who does understand cancer and its treatments yeah. um, and implications yeah, it, because it, it, it keeps you ab- safe your, your, it? your average um, personal trainer won't have exactly what you're looking for in terms of uh, uh, this they can get the information they can download it from um, prostate cancer uk or they can look it up online they can get that information but it's not part necessarily of being a trainer as a becoming a personal trainer what they've got they're, what they're training you for is not necessarily what you need and um you know you, you've got to be careful about not thinking oh god you know i need to lose weight and i need to do basically you need to be really focused on what's going to support you going forward and that is primarily that is muscle strength um you know i not cardio you know because that's you know that is what it is, and I, I've lost quite a bit of cardio capacity when I had COVID. But um, you know, that's not really where I'm, where I'm at. I do a little warm up, um, maybe walk a kilo in, or a kilometer or something on the on the treadmill to, to warm up when I'm in the gym. But that's all I do, and the rest of it is all weights and resistance. Yeah, um, and and it is important because we know as well the side effects of. Um, the hormone treatments is a loss of muscle mass yeah. so and and it impacts on your bones as well so this is where that that muscle strengthening the the resistance the strength training is so important but as i say it's it's working with somebody who is properly qualified anybody who's out there and is interested in finding out more i do i am a member of a lot of um cancer and exercise networks so just you know drop me an email or a message privately and i will see what i can find out for you so in there but what what advice then would you give to men regarding their prostate? Because you had no symptoms, and you know, within a few weeks, we're told this is advanced, um, and it's, I mean, it's treatable, but it's not necessarily curable. Yeah. Um, but what would your advice be? Because you know, you hear of younger and younger men being diagnosed, and there aren't always symptoms. So you said about the PSA test. So, as well as getting a PSA test regularly. What other advice would you give to anybody who's thinking, mm, I've got a prostate, what do I need to do? Yeah, I mean, un- understanding the risks are really important. The, 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 mm. the risk assessment checker on the Prostate Cancer UK website takes 30 seconds. Um, and any man over the age of 50 should be going through that and checking themselves yeah. against that. Because you can't. there is nothing physical you can do to check it. Okay, It's inside you, uh, uh, and that's it. Any changes in your toiletry habits... Get a check. Um, if you're a black male, you are twice as likely to get prostate cancer as a white male. Yeah. If you had cancer in your immediate family, you are two and a half times more likely to get prostate cancer. 
So right. with my what with my mother and my sister having had cancer, I was two and a half times more likely to get it. I didn't know this. If one of those is below 40 when they get it, you are two and a half times again more likely to get wow. prostate cancer, which I didn't know. My sister died at 37. So the odds of me getting prostate cancer were way up, really high, yeah. and I had no idea. So know your medical history. Know the history, right. the medical history of your family, because inside you, you don't know what's going on. You cannot see it. So um, being fit and healthy, you know, you don't have to be a saint, you know, to, to look after your body. Um, but, you know, don't smoke for a start, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Keep as fit and mobile as you can. Um, keep your weight under control, particularly around your waist. Um, and, you know, uh, yeah, regular checks, regular checks. Mm. Um, if it, and if in doubt, ask. No, never carry yeah. a worry with you. If it's if something doesn't feel right, then it isn't right. Go go and get it checked. But I, I think as well, I was going to say it's, it's you know get to know your body, get to know what's normal for you, because then I, I think we often we we sort of swing through life just not really listening to our bodies. I think it's it's worth saying this is your normal, you know, this is how you you urinate normally. This is how often how it feels how. Even even down to how it sounds yeah. and the strength sort of thing. All, all, because all those, all it's those the things. changes that you want to be looking out for. Yeah. Sorry? All those things, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And uh, any any change at all, um, however small, as you, know, as you get older, yeah, your body changes and you do, and things do mm. change. But that doesn't mean to say you shouldn't check and make sure that's normal, yeah. you know? And, and yeah. Um, it's it's one of those things that I, I know since I since I diagnosed and when I when I came out about my diagnosis and put it on on, on all my social media, I had loads of people saying, "I've been for the test, I've been for the test, I've been for the test," you know, and I'm saying, "Well, that's great, you know, um, that, that's what I that's what I want you to do. Spread the word yourselves as well, you know, because it's not just it's one in eight of us will get it. One in eight, yeah. one in eight men will get prostate cancer. One in four if you're and a black man." And, and for a lot of people as well, it sounds, you know, the word cancer can be very scary. But actually, with prostate cancer, you know, most people will die with it rather than of it yeah. as well. So, but the earlier you you can get diagnosed, you can, it, it's curable. the better the prognosis. It is curable. If you but even early. late, yeah, it it doesn't mean there's no hope. It just means, you know, there are there are different things that need to be done, need to be tried. And I think, you know, one of the things you, you've kind of said, and you've, you've mentioned it a couple of times, is, is your men tend not to talk, is men, talk, yeah. get talking. You know, ask, has anyone had a PSA exam? What does it mean? What does it involve? Ask the questions, because I think the more we normalise these sorts of conversations, and I think women are a bit more, oh, I found a bit of a lump or whatever. Um, I think we're a bit more used to discussing some of these things yeah. but men yeah there's, know, a, there's a lot of things around did you see the game last night um and we're both sari supporters so we might not necessarily talk about the game last night or whatever but but um it's i think for men it's you don't have to sort of suddenly say right everybody let's talk about prostates but you know just just start to open up these conversations particularly if you're worried yeah because you never know you know standing over a pint or something someone's saying oh i've noticed you know or, or noticing something when somebody pees and saying oh you're a bit hesitant there yeah opening up the conversation however it comes naturally is so important in maybe encouraging somebody to go for a test that wouldn't have done yeah. or if, you, if you're if you're in the pub with your mate and you know it's one of, you know, he's going four or five times when you're only going once just you yeah know, saying you're going quite a lot if you have you been checked you know yeah uh, and don't don't worry about your gp the gps have seen it all before you know there's, you're not going to go exactly. to them with anything that they haven't seen before so you're you're not your that's not unique it's only your inside your insides that are unique um you know, yeah but they, what you go to them with they, they would have seen it all before and they'll have heard it all before and there's no need it's difficult for me and i understand i understand that having been there myself how emotionally challenging it is, anything around that kind of behaviour, whether it's, uh, you know, um, urinary problems or uh, sexual problems or whatever, um, all these things, your doctor has seen it all before. So yeah. don't be afraid to, to, to say, I'm not sure about this. What can we do? And they'll check yeah. it for you. And 
you know, if it's caught early, um, your prostate can be removed without, you know, and it's done nowadays with robotic surgery and, yeah. um, you know, and boom, finished, you know, and, and for a lot of people, if it's caught really early, that's it. It's gone and done. If it's not too, um, if it's contained, but it's still a little bit further forward, it's followed up with maybe with chemo, chemotherapy or radiotherapy. All these things. There are so many different variations of treatment now. Um, I asked my oncologist about radiotherapy, and to which she said, oh, "I don't think we want to go that far yet. You know, we'll keep that back for later." Um, so you know, there's no no rush to th you know throw massive doses of radiation at your body um, just to keep you healthy. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, stay as fit and healthy as you say. Eat, eat lots of vegetables. Do all that kind, of, all yeah. the kind of stuff you expect. But, uh, but don't it's not it necessarily like giving it. up everything, is it? It's not, like you said, it's not being a saint, but it's it's kind of like, okay, 80% of what I do, if I, if I focus on 80% being the good stuff, then then that's okay. That's that's a good balance. But, I mean, any particular advice then for people who are thinking about becoming more active and maybe haven't got a support? I mean, we've, we've talked about Macmillan and things like that, but there may well be people out there who... Who, who don't have prostate cancer but are just thinking, gosh, if being active helps to reduce my risk, what advice would you give to people who are thinking, what do I do, where do I start? Well, walk more, um, get yeah. off the bus and stop early, and you know, and so add more steps into your day. You can get you can download a free app on your phone um, to check you know, the number of steps you're making it, and set yeah. yourself a, a little target. Don't go mad, just slowly, slowly build it. Things you can get at home if you don't want to go weight training. You can get ex these exercise bands um, yep. with varying strengths of, of resistance in them, um, which you can use on your. You know, I use mine on, on the stair post there, and to stretch all my shoulders and arm muscles and things. For legs, use, use the stairs. You know, do stretches. You know, even if you're not building anything, keep them mobile. Keep the muscles stretched yeah. and flexible. Because um, that's what's supporting your knees and um, all your leg bones. And, and there are all these things you can do quite simply. It's, you know, get up and sit up without pushing yourself out of the chair. Sit up using your legs. So you start pushing through your legs to keep, you know, strengthening any muscles. All this stuff is is armchair fitness. You, you can find online yeah. really, really easily. And it's a good place to start. Uh, because once it becomes easy, you think, oh, what next? You know? Uh, and then you then you can worry about going whether you want to go to the gym or whatever. But. And and that's it. I think a lot of people think I I'm just not fit enough for the gym. I just can't go. But actually, for a lot of people, the gym is a progression. It's somewhere to move on to. If you're very, if you're doing very very little at the moment, then anything that you do is 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 an improvement. So if you rarely walk or if you you don't do much strength, do you know? Do five press ups against the wall. Um, do do three or four squats. You know, if if you're doing nothing, that's an improvement. That's a start. You know, my big thing is always start where you are. And if where you are is doing nothing, then a five minute walk. As I say, four press ups against the wall, four squats. That's a start. Yeah. Have a look at some of the the reputable um, stuff that's out there, and and look at okay, what can I stretch? What can I? How can I improve just in everyday tasks? Um, and I think sometimes people think it's just it's going to be too hard, too much, too long, too difficult. Whereas we can start simply. Yeah. And well, if, it, if it's too hard, you're it's... doing too much. You know um, exactly. You yeah. Know, so, to, so take it easy. Um, you will, you if you just let, let, gently let yourself into it, you'll find naturally it, it progresses because your yeah. muscles become used to it, and they they expect to be stretched a little bit more, and it becomes just sort of self fulfilling and. Um, and before you know where you are, you will be a little bit fitter and a little bit stronger. Um, and I will say my other big thing I always say is make it enjoyable. You know, if if you if you hate walking but love swimming, then swim. If you if you hate swimming but love jogging, then jog. If you like cycling, cycle. Do something that you enjoy because you know the most effective exercise that you can do is the one that you do. Yeah. Um, and. If you enjoy it, you're more likely to start really to look forward to it, particularly as, you know, coming into the spring, the summer, depending on the side of the world you're on. But it, you get lovely sunny days, even if they're quite chilly, but it's just so lovely to be out there. And, you know, even if you walk quite slowly, 
it's still activity. It's still good for you. Um, So, you know, don't ever think that's not enough or I can't do enough. Whatever you can do. And don't think it's not for me because it absolutely is for you. Yeah. And there's so much, there are so many opportunities out there now, different things that you can do that I think it's really, really important. Kevin, thank you so much for joining me today because I think hearing about your journey, hearing about the treatments that you're having and the impact they have on you, but also the fact that you've, You've you've kept active, you've kept active, um, and that's an important part of your treatment, if you like, yeah. uh, because it is part of treatment. We we think of activity as is something else, but actually, when it comes to cancer, you know, it's part of the the treatment pathway now. Um, and the more that people know about it and kind of say, right, yep, this is for me, um, and all, all, the better all it's going to be. Even it, if- and, it's, and it's not just snake oil salesmen. You know, it, it's clinical evidence that the fitter you are going into yep. treatment, the the, the yep. better your recovery rates. So, um, you know, all the, all clinicians know this, um, and, um, but it's not part of the diagnosis to treatment pathway. You have to have a certain ownership mm-hmm. of this yourselves. So, um, you know. So, so getting a bit fit in the first place is a good place to start. Yeah. yeah. But so, before yeah. you get ill, get fit sort of thing. Exactly. Um, Build your fitness up beforehand, which reduces your risk, as we yeah. know. And it can also help, you know, it can help improve how treatment affects you and also help you manage side effects and things. And it is, it is an important part of um, either recovery or maintaining the quality of life that you want to maintain. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So, any last words of advice for everybody out there? Um, let's, yeah, basically, stay as healthy as you can. You know, and, and yeah. even when there's bad news, sometimes there's always a a, a, a better outcome around the corner. And so, the, the more you yeah. stay positive, you know, the better it is. I'm one year into my cancer journey now, um, and um, originally, when I looked at it, maybe four to five years was possibly what they were expected for a diagnosis like mine. I'm setting my targets further than that. Um, yeah, you know, and uh, and whatever it, it throws at you, and the hormone treatment throws some weird sort of side effects at you. Yeah. Um, you know, it's it's better than being in a box, mate. You know, let's get let's get real and yeah. get fit, keep moving forward, and keep looking to the future because it's it's still out there. Kevin, thank you so much for joining me today. It's been really, really interesting and I hope it helps people out there. But more importantly, I hope it inspires people out there to get tested on a regular basis because, let's face it, prevention or early diagnosis is is what we want Absolutely. more yeah, for everybody. Been a pleasure. Thank you so much. And I'll put links to Prostate Cancer UK and Macmillan within the um, podcast. But also, if you do want to get in touch with Kevin, then just contact me and I can help make that happen you've been listening to me sarah belitha and my guest kevin kibble this week talking about prostate cancer thank you for joining us and don't forget to subscribe give us a review and we will see you all again very soon thank you for listening to creating active lives with me sarah belitha and my guests join me each week for more on how to create and sustain everyday activity and follow me online at fitness career mentor or fabulous if you're interested in career development and more on creating active lifestyles.